And it isn't all pretty, and it isn't all nice, and it isn't all comfortable. But learning to handle yourself in what is a completely different environment is actually very useful. And I think it, as you do it, you gain in confidence and you gain in competence. And those are really important facets for you as individuals as you grow professionally. So UK Sport, as Fiona said, is the body responsible for our Olympic and Paralympic investment. We have about 125 million a year, about 100 million of which goes into our Olympic and Paralympic sports. Just to give you a, a picture of where we are, in 1996 in Atlanta, uh, Great Britain won one gold medal and came 36th in the medal table. Now, if you're in business, you'd say you were struggling somewhat. Uh, if you were in school, you'd say you were in special measures. So we were in deep trouble. Uh, in 1997 comes the lottery. Money gets invested into elite sport. Uh, and, and what that allowed was our athletes and our coaches to grow and develop and spend full time working at their sport. The question I was asked in 2003 when I went in to uh, UK sport was that we were 10th in the medal table. We'd been 10th in Sydney. We looked like we were heading for much the same position a year later in Athens. The question I was asked was, can we do better than that? And having explored and looked at the system, I believed we could do a lot better than that. And I believe that's where we are now in terms of governing body governance. We haven't stood still. Things have improved incrementally, very slowly. Can we do better than that? Yes, we most certainly can. And Fiona told you that uh, this year, third in the medal table, 29 gold medals, 65 in total. Very interesting, the business plan put together in 2005 when we were trying to persuade the then Chancellor Gordon Brown to double our money, um, said that we would win 65 medals in London 2012. So those of you in business, I think you'll think that's pretty cool, really. <laughs> Probably a bit lucky as well, but pretty cool. And one of the things we did to get to that point was we had to change the culture of British sport. You know that old thing where just taking part was good enough? You know, which we're all taught at school, which is great when you're at school. But in the world of elite sport, it's not good enough. And it was changing that culture to say that we would have no compromise. No compromise whatever. Where we invested the money, how we drove the business. Now, it might sound harsh in a world of sport, but that's what it takes to be the best. You have to think of elite sport a bit like Formula One. You know, the fastest car, the best technology, the best research innovation, the best drivers, the best athletes, the best mechanics, sports science, sports medicine, coaches. No, no stone left unturned, no compromise. And I guess where we are now is that we've really moved on fantastically well. You have to remember that when I talk about us doing this, we don't do this. We do this through arm's length bodies. Now imagine changing culture in a business and then stay back from that and say, through your investment, you're going to change culture in 46 businesses. 46 businesses, you're going to change their culture, you're going to change their mindset, you're going to change their drive, their ambition, their desire, and their achievement. That's quite an achievement. And that, that was done by a real cultural shift and by a no compromise approach. And the point I want to make to you is this, that you can have quotas, and I understand why people have quotas. But in the end, we wouldn't have driven performance sport by just saying it's this or bust. It was changing the culture. That's what we've now got to do in terms of the governing bodies. So our governing bodies of sport are, in many cases, beginning to modernize. In many, they are still stuck in a very considerable time warp. So whilst we've driven, if you like, the performance business of sport, we haven't automatically changed the way sport runs. Each of the governing bodies often selects its own people from within the sport. That's how it's worked in the past. So you get the people who were in the sport in 1834, who've been there, bless them, ever since, and somebody says, I think it's Charlie's turn to be on the board, and up goes Charlie. And that's one of the challenges. That isn't how you can run modern business. Although, joking apart, it's often how business does work a bit. You know, it's the guys who've sat there long enough and we escalate them to the board or we know a bloke who, it's often a bloke, we know a bloke who's a good bloke, you know, we'll have him on. 
So what we're going to do in the next four years is we're going to try and really drive professionalism, professionalism and cultural change into our governing bodies. And that means changing the way boards operate. That's going to be massively challenging. And we need more women on those boards. And I'm not going to argue why women are important. I hope to goodness every one of you sitting in this room is absolutely convinced of that. Um, there is, without question, a different dimension of behaviour when women are on the boards. And if I can just take you back to my 2003 board, I inherited a board of predominantly men. There were two women on the board who were there as independent members, and they never came. Never came to the board meetings. Took them both out to lunch. You're on my board, tell me, why aren't you coming to my meetings? We never get a word in edgeways, and we're made to feel inferior when we speak. And I said, well, that's my job. I'm the chair. I want you to come to those meetings, and I'm going to validate every comment you make, and you speak up. And they came, and they began to speak. And they really began to change the debate. The debate had been very one-sided, very dominated in a particular style. And they were both very considered individuals. They were both very capable women. But they'd given up trying to intervene in what was essentially a, a board that was controlled by another man who was allowing that domination, you know? Men love to hear themselves speak. Sorry, I know you're the only man in the room, and I do apologise to you. Because I'm sure you're not like this at all, or you wouldn't be here. So we love you. We love you. We love you. But you know that thing that men find it more easy to speak in that way? You know, you, you sit in a room. A lot of women don't have the confidence to dive into a conversation. So there were some real issues there. So what are we going to do? Open and transparent recruitment. Now, that's going to be a shock to some of the governing bodies. But that's what we are now expecting them to do. Open and transparent recruitment. In other words, the bloke you know, or Charlie, who's a good bloke, who's been there 10 years, that isn't the way he's going to get on the board. It has to go through open and transparent recruitment. We're encouraging them to look at the rotation of boards. You know, you cited one particular sport. I better not get into that uh, particular sport. But I will say, some people have been there a jolly long time on those boards. We now need to rotate boards because it's healthy. I stand down as chair of UK Sport shortly. I've done two lots of four years plus an extra two they gave me to get us to the London Olympics. So I've done 10 years. But public sector board, you can usually do two sets of four years. That's plenty. You need fresh ideas, fresh energy, fresh thinking. That's absolutely right. And good, healthy uh, rotation is important. So we're going to rotate boards. Lots of opportunities, therefore, for women to stick your flippers up and get in there and get on those boards. We're going to ensure that the governing bodies know where to look for people. The advertising that uh, women on boards do, very important. Because a lot of our governing bodies will say, we don't know where to find women. I mean, they do for some reasons, but they don't for boards for whatever reason. <laughs> they don't know where to find women, OK? They, I mean, they just say, oh, well, there's nobody out there at the right level. Well, come on now. You, you are at the right level. Have the courage to have a go. Put your name in there. Not necessarily for sport, if that's not your thing. I've just um, managed to persuade a young lady who actually did play netball for England a long time ago, but is now in asset management, to uh, take on a, a role um, uh, with swimming at a regional level. And she came to see me the other day, and I won't tell you what she said she thought of me for encouraging her to do this. It's tough. I'm not telling you this is easy. I'm not telling you you're going to go along and have a nice cup of tea and it's all going to be jolly. But unless we, all of us, have the courage to break this, then we never break it. You know, did I, did I find being chair of UK Sport fun? No, I hated it. I went home and cried every night for the first six months, and I'm not lying. It was awful. I was treated appallingly, but I hung in there. Now, that board is a very, very different board. A good board, I would suggest. 50% nearly women, very balanced, good board, good debate, good challenge. Everybody accepts everybody can challenge, everybody accepts everybody's there with a valid point of view. So you want to do this? Go for it. Think it's going to be easy? You're wrong, it isn't. We're going to also make sure that on a regular basis, the governing bodies give us their board audit data. In other words, you can't get away with saying, oh, we're trying to do it, but it hasn't worked. We'll give you a little bit of leeway, 
but we're going to really begin to use that data to inform our funding decisions. I am not going to say we are going to sanction sports, we are going to inform our funding decisions. And we're going to make sure that that data is very public and that we begin, just as we did with high performance, to change the culture. Uh, and that's, over the next four, eight years, that's our mission at UK Sport. We want to change the culture. We want to really get world-class people, quality people from outside sport, on sports boards, to really um, move on the governance of sport to a different level. And people like you in this room can add massive value. You may be sitting there and thinking, well, what do I know about tiddlywinks? You don't need to know about tiddlywinks. You need to know about good issues to do with governance. You need to know how to look through a set of accounts. You need to know how to contribute to discussion. You need to know how to challenge things. It doesn't matter. Sometimes the best challenge comes from the most naive people. You know, not, not having that insight is sometimes a way of seeing it more clearly. And so we need that kind of external challenge. So sport needs you. Uh, if you want to be involved, put your hand up, step forward. But as I say, be warned, not a necessarily uh, a tea party and comfortable. And just to finish, as well as working uh, domestically, uh, one of the things we've been trying to do, and Amanda's here, who's done, led on much of this work for UK Sport and done an absolutely outstanding job for us and for women and sport. She's led a, a, a leadership programme for women who are working in sport to encourage them to develop the competence and competence to get higher in the administrative ranks and indeed to get onto international boards. And one of the people that was on our leadership program uh, has just been voted on to the International Volleyball Ethics Committee, first woman ever, which is fantastic. So we do have a low level of people in senior and executive roles, although in UK sport, I think we're beginning to get that balance right. I think we've now got three male directors and three female directors. Um, it takes time to change things. It takes time for people to have confidence that women do these things a different way, but it's just as effective. And I think that's a really important message to you. You know, trust who you are. You're unique. Each of you is a unique individual. You're very special. You may not feel it. You may be sitting there thinking, I don't feel very special at 8.45 on a... Tuesday morning, but you are. And you have to believe in that, and you have to believe in the contribution that you can make. And that contribution is not something you have to dramatically change yourself to be some sort of other person to be successful. Carry on being who you are. Success will come to you as long as you have the confidence to keep being who you are and believing in what you're doing and develop your competence. I, I know this may sound ridiculous having been in sport for 44 years, but I'm still evolving. When I stop learning and I stop evolving, then I'll retire. While I've still things to learn, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm still in it. I'm still in the game. And, and I think you just need to say that all of us evolve and learn. And being on a board is a great way of learning. But let me just finish with a quote from um, Lisa, who is the lady who's just got on the uh, International Volleyball Ethics Committee. And this is her words, not mine, when she sent me an email and she sent one to Amanda. Well, four years on and the volleyball world has changed. From the first FIBA World Congress, where they thought I was the president's wife, to the one in Rome where they thought I was his secretary, <laughs> to last week in the USA being elected as the only woman on the ethics panel. Progress indeed. And it is, but it takes time. It takes courage, it takes a willingness to learn, it takes a willingness to put yourself out there and have a go. And I do not doubt there is not a woman in this room that can't make a really important contribution on a board. Thank you. Thank you, Baroness Campbell. That was very, well, it was inspiring stuff. And I've had a few people who've uh, telephoned me or emailed me recently and said, but, but I, I don't, I, well, I don't, I'm not interested in a sporting board. You know, I'm interested in other boards. Uh, you're going to have lots of different events. It might not be the event that I want to come to. And I said, I don't think that's the point. You know, 
There are those boards, it's about governance and about what you can offer. And I think by coming to an event like this and hearing inspiration, an inspirational talk like that, it can inspire you to target any board, not just a sports board. And that was really helpful. Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce you to our next speaker, who's Ruth Med. Ruth is the co-founder of Women on Boards Australia. Um, and I think I'll let her speak for herself. Thank you.